I'm using a number of these 28C256 electrically erasable read-only memory ICs. And they're getting rather difficult to come by. Um, I've gone through several of my suppliers looking for who's got what and what kind of prices they are. And I've got one supplier that's totally out. Another supplier that has 250 nanosecond access time or read time ICs. That's not going to work. Now they do have 150 nanoseconds, but they're in UV erasable form, which I frankly don't have the high intensity UV light to erase them quickly and don't have the time to set them out on the windowsill to uh, erase them to reprogram them. Another supplier has something that seems to be the correct part number, but it also has a listed in its description a 50 nanosecond access time, which doesn't match the part number. And there's no data sheet associated with it either. So I don't trust this particular one. And I'm afraid it's going to end up being a one-time programmable device, which is almost useless to me. They have another piece that appears to be exactly what I'm looking for, and I confirmed with the data sheet that it is exactly what I'm looking for, but at $272 a piece, I am not willing to put that bill. And another supplier has them, but again, at $256, $257 a piece. Yeah. Not what I'm looking for here. So, yeah, I've got a problem. I want to try to solve that today. Let's get into it. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm building a 16-bit computer from scratch. I hope you'll join me on this journey. So I'm not sure exactly how this is going to turn out today, but I'll take you through my pro thought process. I started off by, well, not really having a good solution for EEPROM and costs and started looking around for alternatives gradually broadened my search from EEPROM into other non-volatile RAM and finally fell upon this particular gem. Now this is a static RAM IC that pin for pin matches the EEPROM that I've been using, but it also comes with an integrated battery cap sitting on top of it that provides that power to the SRAM in the event that it loses VCC. So it comes up with an alternative battery powered rechargeable battery really, but turns the static RAM into effectively an EEPROM. It easily fits into the ROM, EEPROM, EEPROM sockets, providing the non-volatility without any of the requirements for special write timing or limitations on the number of writes that can be performed in a long life lithium button cell so meaning it's rechargeable so i started looking to see what these would cost and unfortunately the costs were a little bit more than i wanted to spend on this but it got me thinking and i thought what if i could build something similar to this myself would i be able to get close to this well, after some more digging around, I found this. And this is a 256K bit or 32K byte CMOS SRAM. But what I found that I liked about it was that it has a wide range of power supplies associated with it. But here was what really caught my attention is even at 1.5 volts, it will hang on to its data. Well, this meant that I could actually come up with some method to hang on to the data using a battery. And in particular, one of those CR2032 coin type batteries. So this had some promise. The costs were even palatable. Not only could I get one of them, but I could actually get 10 of them. And I was going to need memory anyway, because my intention is to have 128 kilobytes of memory in this computer. So as long as I didn't cook them all, I would actually have memory that I needed later. So I got 10. Well, 
and here it is. So this is my static RAM or SRAM, which I'm going to use for both the computer itself, plus hopefully, if everything goes well, the replacement for the EEPROM. How am I gonna do that replacement? So let's talk a little bit about what that would look like. Here is my SRAM, and we'll call this out as pin one, and pin 28, is typically connected to VCC. Pin 14 is typically connected to ground. And what I want to be able to do is take a battery and hook that up here. That's the positive side of the battery and hook that up there. Now there's a problem. You probably see this already in that when this five volt rail here is powered, I'm actually delivering five volts to this battery. And I want to stop that from happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a diode here to prevent 5 volts from bleeding back into this battery. The other challenge I have is when this 5 volt rail is powered off, I don't want this battery trying to power the rest of the circuit. So similarly, what I need to do is I need to add a diode here to prevent the battery from trying to power the rest of the circuit. That's pretty much it. The only thing I am considering here is decoupling because normally I have decoupling between this pin and ground. And so if I add a node here and I add decoupling here to ground, or honestly, I could probably take it over here to this point and connect it in and not connect it to ground directly then I've got a self-contained solution and I've got my decoupling that's handled in that solution. But I also get the benefit, I believe I'm gonna get the benefit, of when I lose power, this capacitor should have the ability to provide some power for a short period of time to the SRAM until it, the voltage gets low enough for the battery to take over. And as long as that's above 1.5 volts, I should be good. That's the theory anyway. Now, this is a 3 volt cell. And I'm planning on putting in more than likely a 47 microfarad, rather relatively large, capacitor there. And the capacitor will have the ability to provide some power as a, as a battery while the voltage ramps down from the power rail to that of the battery. And so it will fill in this gap for a short period of time. So there's my SRAM. Here's my 3 volt CR2032 battery. Plus I've got a little battery holder here that I'm going to use. Here's my 47 microfarad capacitor. I've got a socket for the SRAM that I'm going to drop that into. I've got this piece of strip board here. This is what I was making my temporary buses out of, and I have some extras, so I figure I could use the strip board to get that taken care of. I've got some pins here so that I can drop those into the strip board and be able to drop this then onto my um, Tommy Prom or into my breadboards. And this whole strip board then comes out as a unit that includes the battery and the capacitor and then the diodes. Now, speaking of diodes, I have two of them that I have available to me. These are Schottky diodes, which are, honestly, these have a 0.6 volt forward voltage, which means that between the battery and this node, it's going to drop, I believe, I'm no expert here, so forgive me, there's a voltage drop across this diode of 0.6 volts when it's powering. So that gives me 2.4 volts before we get below it to, to power this IC and I need a minimum of 1.5. Now at some point it's gonna drop below 1.5 over here on the opposite side of the diode and then I, that's when I theoretically am going to lose my memory. Now I could use these which are small signal switching diodes. These have a one volt forward voltage meaning I've got a one volt drop so my three volts now goes to two on the other side of this drop, uh, diode. And I think this is going to end up being the better scenario. This has a faster recovery time though. So switching, I don't remember the exact specs, like 0.4 or 4 nanoseconds versus 10 nanoseconds. Well, this is as good a time as any to interrupt myself. I did miss one 
critical specification, and that is rever reverse voltage, as I was going through the description. What I've got up here on the screen now is a chart that has the specifications of the two types of diodes that I was looking at. The shot key on the left, the signal diode on the right, which is how they're arranged on the screen behind this. The forward current is the same regardless. The recovery time is really inconsequential because of the decoupling capacitor that's going to provide some, some energy while the voltage ramps down and the diode then recovers and is able to supply voltage. The reverse voltage being 30 volts or 100 volts, that's a big difference between them, but they're both within my specifications because I'm only providing just over 5 volts at most. So both of those will handle that. Ultimately, what it boils down to is the forward voltage of the Schottky diode is less than the signal diode, and therefore it's the more favorable diode to use here. So this would be a faster switch. This is a slower switch, but this has a, has a lower voltage drop. I'm not quite so worried about the speed of switching because the capacitor will take care of that. And so it should be perfectly acceptable. I'm far more concerned with the voltage drop and therefore I'm gonna use the Schottky diodes. Let's see what we can do to pull this together and mock this up on the board. I'm gonna be honest with you, it is this node right here that actually gives me the greatest amount of concern. And the reason is, is unless I want to have half this strip board hanging off the top of my breadboards or whatever I'm going to use it, I really don't have a ton of room in order to make all those connections, especially if I have to break a trace between this pin here and the five volt rail, which ultimately these pins would sit right underneath here and then would drop right into the five volt rail. So I have between this point right here and this point right here, I have to break this connection here in order to get what I need out of it. So yes, that's a concern. And I want to try to get at least two out of this, two being two, uh, uh, strip boards out of it that I can use two SRAMs as EE proms. So I'm wondering if I put it here, which then gives me the ability to break the trace here. I don't know if you can see that behind my finger here. So here's the edge of the pins. Here is the pin for the socket. And then right here is a spot where I could break the trace. Now I could get really tight and just try to cut it up here, but I want to I want to make sure that I've got a good separation between the two of them. So I'm going to use the holes as a place to perform that separation. That'll give me the ability then up here to take power off by the diode off to wherever I need to take it. And then I can actually, if you can see it here, I can get up under here and drop a wire in to connect that off to one of these adjacent strips and have that taken care of. So that would then give me the ability to move this node for the IC out to one of these larger strips, giving me the ability to take care of all these different connections here. So that's plan number one. The other plan I've got, I don't know if you can see it here, positive and then negative is a little bit more obscure to look at. The key here is what orientation do I want to put this in here? And I believe I want to put it in such that positive is towards the IC. And that's going to give me some ability to hopefully set this capacitor in here and be able to tie it to the positive side. So the positive side of the battery ultimately comes to one side of the capacitor. The other side of the capacitor is going to be tied to ground. And that's not going to be on this, but rather it's going to be on the, hmm, interesting. Maybe it would be better for me to just tie it and drop it in a couple of holes here and just have it sitting up here above the, above the battery like that. I think I'm going to probably do that instead. That should give me the ability to, to do what I need to with this. I just have to be cautious of this diode. So the two diodes then, once I get into here, will tie things together and... Ultimately, then, if these pins are moved up two holes, these pins down here need to be moved up two holes as well. And that means that I can cut along this set of holes here. I don't have a pin that's going to mark that very well. But this could be a cut line here so that I end up with 
the board that I need. Let me go uh, down to the shop and see if I can make this cut cleanly. Okay, so I got the scroll saw out first time, and it really is the first time I've used that, that piece of equipment. And I used it to cut the strip board along that, that cut line that I determined. And I got some scratches and stuff on the copper. I hope that doesn't end up causing me some problems. But once I was done, I ran it across some high grit tan paper, like 800 grit, like this, so that I could smooth down the copper. Whoops, put that on screen, Adam. So I could smooth down the copper a little bit so I didn't slice my finger open on it. And of course, my off-cut piece, I did the same thing with, so I have it prepared and ready to go for next time. So that should uh, take care of that component. And then I got out this... 5 30 seconds drill bit and I tested here in the corner and what I did is I put it's just a normal twist bit um, I'm not using any kind of power implement for this so just using my fingers uh, with a twist bit I wouldn't recommend a, a brad point or a forstner at all it just won't work uh, but what I did is I put it into one of the holes here and twisted it until it removed all of the copper on either side of the hole and I was able to test that there's a little trace of copper left over here in the corners I was able to test that and there was no continuity between the copper piece here and what was over here so this is how I'm going to actually separate the uh, copper when it comes to doing it in the middle of this board here is I will just simply put the drill bit into one of the holes and twist it pushing on it until it actually uh, uh, cuts away the copper and some of the fiberglass that's underneath it and then that will provide a separation in those traces and i did break out the tester just to confirm that i did that accurately so now that that's about done let's get into trying to assemble this okay the first order of business here is going to be to identify where i need to cut traces in order to make things work the key here is I need this row of pins to be in this location. And then ground is down here. And I need an extra spot to run a wire up in here. So if I flip this over, here is where, here is where this pin ends. I'm not going to need anything here. So I'm actually going to remove that spot. And then I'm going to step down and remove this spot as I'm working my way across here. And then I'm going to, in such a way, because ultimately this pin up here is power and I need as much space here as I can. So I'm going to have this be the one that I remove down there. So basically these dots end up being where I'm going to place that drill bit in order to remove copper. Let me get into that. Now, as I'm doing this, you may end up asking, well, aren't you afraid you're going to poke through the board into your finger? And not really. Um, and the reason I say that is because the board itself is so thick that, uh, and the angle is so shallow on the end of this uh, twist bit, that for me to get all the way through, I will have done much more damage than I want before I even get to my finger. Okay, that works. Now I should mention that it makes it really important to get all these little sh metal shards up and into the trash properly before you do a whole lot else because there is sharp copper down in here. Okay, so the first order of business here is going to be to determine where this copper line is going to go. And with the pins in down here, the best place for that is going to be here. And so I need to cut a piece of copper that's going to run from here all the way across to this other side over here. And so let me get that cut and shaped. Okay, so with that there, this is going to be, whoops, too far over. It's going to sit there, and I think that's going to be perfect as long as I don't melt that uh, piece of copper there. So the next thing here is to get the two ends of that soldered in place. Okay. 
And that melted the uh, insulation here too, so that ought to be fun. I gotta make sure that I'm very cautious with that. Okay, that still fits. Now, let's see here. I do need to take this pin and separate it from because I'm going to have these pins down here like this. My power is going to come in here and need to go on this this strip here. So I need to make a, a, a separation here. So that's right here in between the pins and the socket here. So let me get that done. So the next thing I want to do is I want to actually extend what would be this small strip here out to include this entire strip over here so that those are so that the input here to the IC so this would be power up here that's this pin right here let me make that a little bit bigger so you can see it that's this pin I'm talking about right here this is where all those connections need to be and I want that to be include all of this so I can make all of these connections here in that node like I said that was the one I was worried about so let me get a piece of wire prepared here. Okay, just checking my work here. Make sure I'm not doing anything silly. I've got no insulation on this because, frankly, it's going to melt at this point. Alright, so I have created this connection here and I have created extended this connection here now for the battery the battery holder is going to go here and what's important here I'm thinking that's probably not going to be the best thing here I probably need to remove this wire that ought to be fun to do now, while I'm cleaning up my mess here, I did have another look at the data sheet last night in between recording that segment and editing it today. What I realized is that in standby mode, which is where I have my standby current, I need to have chip enable set high. And more specifically, if my standby current one, which is within 0.2 volts of the input volt or supply voltage, I have typically one microamp of power consumption. So long story short, what that means here is that my chip enable on pin 20 also needs to be tied high, but I don't want to tie it high. I want to actually create a pull-up resistor against what I'm supplying here for VCC. So that'll get added next. Still have a little bit of exposed wire that I didn't want, but that will have to do. Okay, let me see if I can get this battery holder soldered in. This ought to be fun to try to do. All right, so that gives me my battery hookups. So now I need diodes. And let's see here, I need a diode from the three positive of the three volt battery to this node. I should make sure it's in view. And that's right. So those are in correctly. You get those soldered down. Now the last thing here is the capacitor. And the capacitor needs to go from this common node rail to ground. So this is the common node rail, this is the ground up here. Let's get a little bit of heat sink on that. This is coming coming together. I just got to get a little bit of heat on this. Okay, so as I alluded to last night, I've got to get a pull-up resistor here wired in for chip enable. That's going to be on pin 
20 and what I did is I cut a resistor and the leads are asymmetrical which it should be no real big deal here but I had to put the heat shrink on it so that I could protect the exposed wire and so the key now is to make sure that's wired into pin 20 of this socket all right, I think that's it. Let me just do some counting here. So this is 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Yeah, that's in the right spot. That should allow me then to hold this down while I get this soldered up here. Okay, next up here is going to be to tack down the cradle as well as the pins for connecting it. So let me get that done. And again, I'm just tacking at this point. Okay, and then the pins. This one's going to be fun because it has a solder dam here that I've got to get through. Okay, everything's in place. Let me just get it all soldered up. Yeah, and this took me about another 30 minutes to solder up. So I'm going to cut this a little short so we can get into some sanity checks and hopefully some testing. Okay, the first test is going to be a test for bridges to make sure that I didn't bridge anything and soldering anything up. So that's going to be both side by side and across. And then I'm also going to run a bunch of tests to make sure that I have continuity on each of these pins to make sure that I can actually actually did what I said I was going to do and connect everything. So let me get through those really quick here. Okay, that looks good. Now before I put the IC in, let's do a little bit of battery checking here. So positive towards the positive. Now that should give me three volts here. And it's not. Why is it not giving me three volts there? Do I have that diode in backwards? Helps if I put it on voltage. Adam, that works much better. So I should have three volts here, 3.3, nice. I've also got three volts here. I should not have three volts. Whoops, I should not have three volts here. I've got 1.5, why do I even have anything there? On this pin to ground, I am expecting no volts. Why am I getting 1.5 volts there? I got to think about that. Okay, a couple of things here. One, I want to correct a problem with my IC. And I have a 10K resistor that's now doing a pull-up. So that takes care of that. I'm not sure how I'm getting this 1.5 volts there. And I'm going to have to ponder that for a little bit more than just an evening. But what I do want to do is plug it in and take a look at a few things here. For example, setting this to voltage. And of course, I've got a ridiculous amount of glare. Okay, so the chip is going to see 5.16 volts. This is what's coming off the rail off the power rail here is 5.2, 5.21. 
up here, which is still the same node, 5.21. The other side of the diode, 5.16. 5.15, 5.16. So it's resulting in a slight drop here. Negative 5.2, 5.2. So everything is looking good here. If I pull the power, so now we're working off the capacitor and the battery, 5.13, and you can see it kind of slowly walking down as the capacitor is giving up its stored charge, which is good. Now, excuse my head here. Not that one, that one. This is my chip enable, and so it's down to 4.9. Yeah, it's draining the capacitor. It's not even gotten to the point where the battery would take hold and actually provide any, any power at all. Yeah, it's still draining the capacitor. So with that, let's try putting this RAM in. It's a pain to get back out, so it's in, it's in. So even with the RAM in, I think the uh, voltmeter is actually draining the capacitor faster than the SRAM is. This is about 4.5 volts, 4.4. So I think it's actually dropping slower than I can register on the voltmeter. So this is really a tidy little circuit here. Here's my programmer. Now I should, in theory, oh, that's bad. I did not even consider that. Little fussy to get inserted because the lever doesn't come all the way up. But let's see if I can program it. First of all, can I read it? Well, it's showing not erased. That's probably an okay thing. Got random bytes. Let's erase it. All right, so I was able to fill it with Fs. I turn it off, no more power here. Okay, I'm sorry, OBS is giving me some trouble here. Power's not on, so I'm working off capacitor, working towards being on the battery. That is not hot, that's not warm at all, so that's good. If I power it back on, I should be able to dump the beginning. Ooh, I lost some data, that's not good. That is not working the way I wanted it to. Well, that's awful. So I believe my Arduino has lost its programming. So I need to go back to that and figure out what I did wrong there. I think I might have this figured out. And I'm no expert here. And so I'm going to do my best to try to explain what I think is going on. Then I'm going to make a change to try to see if it corrects what I am seeing. But of course, if you see some glaring error in what I'm saying, somebody please say something down here in the comments because I don't want anybody to take what I am saying as gospel because I have no formal training in this. I'm learning as I go along. I found this article, and I'll leave the link to it down in the description. I found this article online, and there's a statement in here that caused me to do some thinking. And that is that a reverse bias Schottky diode will experience a higher level of reverse current than a traditional diode. And of course, this will lead to more leaky current when connected in reverse. And I think that's what I'm seeing here. Okay, so first a little bit about what we're talking about here. If we, and I know it's it, totally incorrect to use water as an analogy for electricity, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's the easiest way for me to get my head around it. Um, there's two aspects to electricity, and that is voltage and current. Now, current, if you want to think about it in terms of water, in my mind anyway, is analogous to how fast the water is moving. Voltage is analogous to the size of the body of water that's moving. For example, if you've got a mile wide river that's moving at a very slow pace, you've got a lazy river. And that is a very high voltage, but very low amperage or very low current. Now, on the other hand, if you have 
a narrow stream of two inches of water that's moving very quickly, you're going to get swept off your feet and carried downstream. Uh, there's just, I mean, there's news article after news article after news article of people actually trying to attempt something like that and getting in a whole lot of trouble because of it. And in electricity, as I understand it, it's the amperage, which is the more critical of those two. You don't want to deal with anything that's high amperage, even in low voltage situations. Okay, so what does that relate to this? Well, if this diode is leaky and there is some reverse current that's happening going from my common power rail back to the rail here, um, which is my power input onto this little board, if there is some reverse current that's going on, I believe that there is some voltage, a pool of electrons that are pooling up here on this particular node where when I measure the voltage potential between this node and ground, I'm coming up with some value. Well, that's what I think is going on anyway. So I went to the data sheet and it's not on this page. I'm using a uh, SD103B, by the way. So 103B, the leakage current at 20 volts for a 103B is five microamps. Well, that seems significant enough to at least create a pool of electrons, which would create a, vol uh, a voltage difference, a voltage potential. Now, the other small, small signal diode that I used, which is a 4148, I considered using, I should say. When I look at the reverse current here at 20 volts, I'm not dealing with high temperature, I'm dealing with low temperature. That's 25 nanoamps. That's much lower, like an order of magnitude lower, <laughs> or three orders of magnitude lower, if you will. So I think ultimately what it boils down to is I just used the wrong diode. So let me get them swapped out. I've got uh, plenty of these uh, small signal diodes, and I'm going to replace, at least for the start here, this diode with this small signal diode which means I'm going to have to desolder this and remove it from the board and what have you. Now, as far as some of the issues I was having with the Arduino here, I did get it reprogrammed and it appears to be working now. So for whatever reason, the voltage leaking back out onto VCC here caused this to lose some of its programming. Not good, but at least it's recovered and I should be able to program the uh, SRAM. Really, it's not an EEPROM anymore. The SRAM properly once I get uh, this. So let me get the diode desoldered and replaced with this and we'll come back and give it a test again. Now, when I put this back in and I pull out my voltmeter, I should have less voltage leakage. I don't know how to end up with zero unless I stack two diodes together in order to reduce that to near zero. Let's see what happens when I try to program this. You know, real quick. The voltage between here and here would be 5 volts. It's a little bit lower because of the diode that I'm using, but I think that's going to be okay. All right, so let's dump the first bit of memory, and it's full of random stuff. Let's fill. Okay, so it takes the programming, so that's good. Typically, I'm going to pull this out. OBS does not like being minimized. So having taken this out, I can look and see what my power is or my voltage is across the two pins here. And I'm still at 4.3 volts. So I'm doing pretty good here. Uh, still operating off the capacitor. Now, I will tell you that I checked this this morning and it still was producing 3.1 volts. So I think I'm going to be okay as far as maintaining the programming. The only question then becomes, is it going to survive for an extended period of time? So let's plus, plug it back in here. Okay, switch over to the desktop. And again, like I said, it doesn't like being 
minimized. But yeah, it held held just fine. Let me reset the Arduino. That's holding just fine. So the last test then becomes an extended test. Since I'm traveling this next week, I am going to have this video staged and ready to go. And then when I get back and I make the next video following this, I will give you an update as to how this fared during the week that I was gone and away from my desk. So wish me luck with this. Hopefully this ends up being a viable solution for me. Thank you. We'll see you soon.